Welcome to um, the .NET user group. Uh, this session that you're going to see tonight is one of the favourites that I've been looking forward to for a long time. Um, it's called the history of .NET and I think I've been through the history of .NET as a lot of you guys. I've been a lot of the same meetings as uh, Richard and he always has a, a very interesting take on each meeting so it's always awesome. Um, he's going to pretty much compress .NET from 2000 or 2001 up until now. If you include the prehistory, there's 20 years. Yeah, 20 years. 20 years in, uh, in an hour or so. It's going to be fascinating. Um, I remember one specific meeting, and it was with Jim Olshan, and we had been, is that how you pronounce it? Yep. Olshan? The, at the yeah. Evangelist Airlift in 2004. Yes, and we had been madly waiting on the new version of um, Windows, and this version of Windows was going to have .NET in it, was going to have this thing called Avalon, it was going, uh, Avalon was WPF. It became WPF, yes. yeah. And we had Indigo Web Services and we had this WinFS and Jim Olshan came comes out and we were, you know, been, we'd been waiting a long time, you know, years. And we kept getting updates on what was going on. And then he started saying, look, you know, um, Indigo, uh, we, d we think that it's going to be better if we, we, we've got to ship now and we'll just make that a, a download. And um, the WPF stuff, we're not quite ready with that. We'll make that a bit later. And I think with the WinFS, we're over ambitious. We might, we're going to cut that. And one of the, I can't remember who it was, it yelled out, well, what's left? <laughs> and it was just, it was a cutting statement. And it was, uh, and what he said was, well, you know those white screens? You know how it goes white? We nailed that. You will never see a white screen. And every time I see a white screen, I always think about what he said. <laughs> But anyway, I'll let, um, I'll let Richard tell us the story of the history of .NET. Thank you, brother. All right, I, I've already introduced myself, so I'm gonna skip past that for all of you. you know, uh, the reason I got into doing this talk is that uh, this past February 2017 was the 15th anniversary of .NET when it first shipped. And uh, a group of Microsoft folks held a party, the alumni group, uh, ex-Microsofties. But Microsoft itself got involved. The marketing people in behind .NET actually threw a party and invited me to come down and actually record some interviews. And in fact, if you go on Channel 9, you'll find these little five to seven minute interviews I did that night. I did about 20 of them with uh, a bunch of the old .NET people. And we just sort of told stories. You know, I kind of knew those folks, they knew me, it was, a, it was a fun set of conversations, but I came out of it thinking, wow, if we don't write this stuff down soon, we're gonna lose it, we're gonna forget. It's been 15 years, and so I have in my mind to write a book. Maybe a video series, maybe a set of podcasts, because I kind of know my way around that. Uh, so I, this is sort of my first cut of the notes to explore the idea, so I'm happy to share it with you, but I know there's more work to be done, and I'm always happy to take feedback. So uh, let's jump forward to the beginning of Microsoft, this terrible, terrible logo. Because that's the really, you know, the first logo of Microsoft when they were, they made basic, that's what they did. This is actually out of the Computer Museum in, uh, in Northern California. It's the, one of the original basics that, that Bill Gates and, and Paul Allen created on paper tape for the Altair 8800. But this is the beginning of Microsoft. Microsoft's first products were programming languages. That's where they really came from. And they made basics for all kinds of devices. The first time I ever saw Bill Gates, he must have been in his late 20s. I was a teenager and I was at a Heathkit office in Vancouver and he was trying to explain to us why if you buy a Heathkit, you should buy the advanced edition because it has the Microsoft basic on it, which is so much better than the Heathkit basic. But fast forward a few years to this version of Microsoft. This is the 80s logo, uh, where Microsoft changed. And what changed Microsoft? DOS. They suddenly had a business of operating systems. Now, how did this happen? Why did IBM choose a little unknown company like Microsoft to provide DOS to them? Well, interesting story that in the 1960s, the U.S. government decided to standardize what computers the U.S. government was going to use. And they held a competition and eight companies participated, including IBM and Hewlett Packard and SCO and DAC. 
and to produce a set of hardware and tools for standardization of computing, and IBM won that competition with the S360, the mainframe, and a language called COBOL. And of course, the side effect of the U.S. government standing on the, uh, to standardizing on it is a lot of Amer large American companies also standardized it. So suddenly IBM was this huge organization in computing to the point where the Department of Justice thought that they were a monopoly and put certain constraints on them. In fact, the I IBM signed a consent decree in 1977 saying that they would only build internally critical technology for their primary products and they would outsource non-critical technology. And one of the examples of this outsourcing event was for the IBM PC, the Model 5150. They were looking for an external operating system. Now the first operating system for the 5150 was CPM, but they found this little company who said they could produce a version of DOS uh, and ultimately did and kind of set Microsoft on the path to become its own monopoly. Uh, funny how in the end it's always the US government's fault, but that's a separate issue. Fast forward a few more years to the 1990s and the next Microsoft logo, and uh, we have a much larger company now building a lot of development tools to the point where they're trying to consolidate them. And the first time we see this consolidation is a product called Visual Studio 97. Now let's talk on this box a little bit because the big dev products that Microsoft made at the time, and this is all in the Windows era now, so Windows 95 is already out, S, uh, Windows 98 is imminent, NT exists, and their big dev product is C++ 5, Visual Basic 5. They'd also along the way bought Fox Pro, and then they had two newer tools. They had J++, which was Java. A couple of years before, Bill Gates had recruited Anders Halsberg out of Borland to write Java for Microsoft, and he made J++. And this was the second version of J++, the 1.1 edition. Now the idea behind Visual Studio at this time was to, rather than have separate runtimes for each development tool and separate IDEs for each development tool, they were going to all consolidate into one, save the work, have specialist these sort of things, build a nice consistent IDE. They didn't deliver that in the 97 edition. In fact, only two products used the same IDE. J++ and Interdev both used the common IDE. I didn't talk a lot about Interdev because who really wants to? That was Microsoft's first attempt to really build development tools for the web. It had some challenges. But Fox Pro VB and C++ were still using their own IDEs in this box of Visual Studio, the first version. Now the second version, which came out in 98, they changed the numbering scheme to 6. You'll see this theme occur a few times inside of Microsoft. So it was C++ 6, Fox Pro 6, VB 6, the third version of J++, which they would call 6. The third version of Interdev, which they would also call 6. But they all used one IDE, so they had made a big advancement there. Now a few things happened at this point. That version of Java was so good, and 90% of desktops this time are Windows, that it takes off. Java does extremely well. And Sun Microsystems gets a little freaked out. Plus Microsoft does, especially for that era, what Microsoft always does, which is they start extending Java to be better at Windows. It supports calm objects, does different inter interoperability. So uh, Sun sues Microsoft and says, hey, you know, you're not following the rules for Java. You can't make Java. And they agree, they avoid a major lawsuit by not building Java anymore. They're gonna take Java completely out of the product. Anders Halsberg stops working on Java entirely and starts working on C Sharp. Yeah, one would argue C Sharp wouldn't exist if Sun hadn't stopped Microsoft from developing Java any further. So that's, that's where that begins. But at this point, we have this initial shipping version and it's, a, it's an important version. That was the last version of VB and uh, we move forward from here. And I've got to throw this picture up. This is actually a Getty image uh, of these two guys looking very happy. This is July of 1998. And this is sort of the beginning of the gestation of .NET. And the reason they look happy is that all the bad things that are about to happen to them haven't happened yet. <laughs> it's only a few months. This is July. 
in November, the Department of Justice will start pursuing Microsoft for anti-competitive practices in a serious way. Now, it's not the first time they've done that. They've actually done it earlier in the 90s as well, around the earlier versions of Windows and Office, and they'd made a deal and had moved on. But this particular one was different. So Bill had put out his letter about the internet a few years before, and Microsoft had gotten very serious about the internet. And they'd incorporated Internet Explorer as sort of core to the operating system. And a company called Netscape took exception to that because their product was this browser, and they didn't like the fact that Windows always led with IE. And Microsoft had done a fairly good job of showing that IE was vital to the whole process, but it was considered a non-competitive practice. And so Bill Gates gets subpoenaed by the US Senate. And you can watch this interview on YouTube if you care to. He is, let's say he doesn't help his cause. He's a fairly difficult interview. And you've got to understand, think about this picture. This is them to on top of the world. His mission had been a PC on every desktop, and he pulled it off. There were more computers in the world than ever before. And they were almost exclusively running Windows. But now a couple of hard years are going to come down. It's a year in trial, and at the end of that year in 99, Microsoft is declared a monopoly and is ordered to break up an operating systems version, a company, and an everything else company. And Bill Gates steps down as the CEO of Microsoft, and his friend Steve Ballmer, who he's known since college, steps up and takes over and successfully negotiates over the next year not to break up Microsoft and to create the consent decree that sort of sets the stage for what's going on. So I, I need to put this as we talk about .NET, this is an important aspect, context around the whole thing. Key parts inside of the consent decree were opening up source code for Windows to certain audiences. So the real player folks who were complaining that their player never worked as well as the Microsoft player. They thought there was actually code in it. It says, if it's real player, don't play properly. They have, they have them be able to see the source codes that they knew that wasn't true and could adapt more effectively. Uh, Microsoft revealed a lot of source code primarily to allow third-party competitors in their spaces to compete more effectively. And it's one of the reasons that Steve Ballmer says things like Linux is a cancer. He was early talking about the GPL license and the effect that it had on ownership of code because they were a closed source company and he was being forced as part of that consent decree to open up this code. And in the same time, there's a whole effort going around in the development side that would eventually become .NET. And I think it's interesting to think in terms of the fact that they did not set out to make .NET. They were actually addressing three different problems. And I'm going to talk about the three problems with three different faces attached to them because they worked on those problems. But I want you to understand there are hundreds, even thousands of people behind solving each of these problems. The first was the runtime problem and Jason Zander who today is a VP inside of Microsoft, worked on this problem right at the very beginning. And the battle was pretty simple. The VB runtime and the MFC runtime for C++, both more or less did the same things. They were wrappers over top of Windows to allow you to draw on the screen efficiently and to make applications. And it was too expensive to make two runtimes. Why are we maintaining two completely separate runtimes that essentially do the same thing? Can we have a common runtime? So that was a conversation on its own, trying to come to a common runtime in one form or another. And this is originally part of the COM Plus group. So as COM is continuing to advance, a group of folks that are trying to come up with a common runtime. They will also eventually take on the managed memory problem. Because in analysis for both of the runtimes, the primary issue that developers have, whether you're writing a C++ app or writing a VB app, is memory leaks. And managed memory is a way to take on that problem as a whole. Next, our friend Anders Halsberg, originally brought in to work on Java, now working on C Sharp. He also builds another set of tools called J Sharp, which is a bridge to bring his J++ developers across to C Sharp. Now, this is a bigger problem than you think because he's also got to have a new runtime. They can't have the JVM. That was part of the deal that they made with Sun. And he also commits to a set of Windows-based class libraries. 
So back in those early days of development, you picked your operating system, and it was probably Windows, and you picked your development language, and there were plenty of choices in that space, not just Microsoft, and you also picked a set of libraries and tools that you, you would build against. And Anders had a vision of having one consistent set of libraries. We'd eventually known it as the framework, but at that time it was the Windows-based class libraries. Third, our friend Scott Guthrie. A new graduate out of Duke University joins Microsoft in 1997. This is the only job he's ever had. He's coming up on his 20th anniversary at Microsoft this year. His first job is working on the NT Option Pack for a man named Mark Anders. NT Option Pack contains IIS4 and active server pages. They ship it at the end of November of 97. And as normal, as that was part of Studio 97, it was, as is normal at Microsoft, after you get a major shipment, you take a couple of weeks off. That's your break before you get working on the next version. And because it was December, most of them took pretty much the whole month off because it was Christmas. But Mr. Guthrie, being a 20-something and not particularly concerned with going home, pretty much has a month off and doesn't like ASP very much and tries to come up with something better. He calls it ASP+, and he has a mission. And his mission is to bring object-oriented development to web development and to make a really great web development tool. And by January, when everybody comes back to work, he's got a prototype working. Did it in a month on his own. And the programming language he was using was? Java. Java. Then C Sharp isn't ready yet. It's 1998. So the first prototypes of what would eventually be ASP.NET, at this time called ASP+, eventually we called ASP Next, and at some point called ASPX, before they finally come up with the .NET moniker, worked in Java. And they liked it. They were impressed by it. Get rid of the Java stuff. And off they went. So those are the three pieces that become .NET as a whole. The runtime problem, the languages base class <coughs> library problem, the web problem. Fast forward to 2000. Now it's been a couple of quiet years for Microsoft and very hard years. After shipping DevTools on a regular basis almost every year, and they had one out in 97, they had one in 98, nothing out in 99 while the battle of the DOJ is going on. And in 2000 they have a PDC. And for the most part people had no idea they were doing anything new here. But remember the consent decree is in development right now. And so when Microsoft announces this new development environment they call .NET, they're going to make it .NET centric. They started out calling it Next Generation Windows Services and then changed it to Next Generation Web Services. They called it a new platform based on internet standards and they were going to publish both the language and the runtime as ECMA specifications. So C Sharp was in, under ECMA 334 and the CLR under ECMA 335. This is not open source, these are specifications, but this is all an effort of Microsoft to demonstrate their openness to deal with this battle around the Department of Justice. And of course there's going to be side effects of that because these specifications are out in the wild and a young man by the name D Miguel Diacaso will grab onto them and do some interesting things. Also in 2000, at the PDC, they released Windows 2000. And I mention this because this was a very important version of Windows. This brought the 9X line together with the NT line to have one kernel. And so it simplified the development model a great deal. They also, this is the point where Windows stopped being available for the Alpha, for the MIPS, and for the PowerPC. Everything was going to be Intel going forward. So they eliminated the hardware extraction layer. They also committed to TCP IP as the primary networking protocol. Up until 2000, it was still a debate whether it was going to be NetBuoy or IPX or TCP IP. And in 2000, they commit to the one. This is also the year that the first Pentium 4 ships and Intel breaks the one gigahertz barrier on processors. So this is kind of the beginning of that Wintel hegemon as we really, you know, often is referenced where that's the only way you're going to consume Windows. And in 2001, at the next PDC in Los Angeles, earlier in the year, so this is October, in July, at an O'Reilly conference, Miguel Diaz announces the Mono Project. And Mono is Spanish for monkey. He has a monkey thing. And so he's going to build an open source version of .NET and C Sharp that runs on Linux. It's a crazy, ambitious thing to do. Uh, a month later, IE6 is announced. 
Remember when IE6 was new and innovative? Woo! Uh, actually ahead of XP itself, which XP would come out in 2001. But also at the PDC is the first release candidates of the .NET Framework, Visual Studio, XP, the tablet development environment, 2001, and my passport and my services, codename Hailstorm, which flop mightily, not the least of which because Microsoft is a bit of a pariah right now, having gone through the battle of the DOJ and been declared in a monopoly and they're one of the most hated companies in the world, and so nobody's going to use them for services for anything. But the consent decree gets signed the next month, and Microsoft's now committed to five years of this uh, showing source code and, and you know, complying with the specifications of the consent decree, although it will ultimately be extended to 10 years. And so XP ships. We have fond memories of XP, but it wasn't this version of XP. We have fond memories of the later version of XP. This version of XP didn't know what USB was. In fact, I remember referring to it as Windows 2000 with the Fisher-Price interface, because it had the nice curvy, bubbly, colorful buttons and things on it. I mean, it was a very sweet version of Windows, and it was the definitive version of Windows. I mean, this version of Windows persists somewhat even today shipped in November of 2001, and it'll be around for a long time. The other thing that happens in 2001 is the flurry of malware. Just a huge explosion. February of 2001, the Anna Kornikova virus. July of 2001, red, Code Red Worm 1. August of 2001, Code Red Worm 2. Uh, September of 2001, the Nimda Worm. It's a side effect of having a dominant operating system is every hacker in the world is trying to find exploits and they're succeeding. And by January of 2002, Gates puts out a new letter. And just like he did the, the internet letter, he puts out the trustworthy computing letter. And Bill has a remarkable power over all of Microsoft. When he says, stop what you're doing and work on security, everybody does, including the Windows team. Now in January of 2002, when he puts out this letter, XP's already shipped and Service Pack 1 is already committed to. You go, your first Service Pack is really all the stuff that didn't make it into your primary release, so, and any immediate fixes. So the XP1 is already well-defined, which is why the security patch for XP will be XP Service Pack 2. And so a core group, some of the best developers that my, Windows developers Microsoft have, is now pouring over this security change. And I think Microsoft makes a substantial mistake at this moment by calling it Service Pack 2 rather than version 2 of XP. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. However, in February of 2002, so the letter came out in 2002, in January 2002, in February of 2002, the first version of Visual Studio uh, .NET ships with C Sharp 1.0, the first top to bottom object oriented language Microsoft's ever made. And they, the pitch, the marketing pitch for this is 22 languages one platform. The one platform, obviously, Windows. The question is, 22 languages. It's taken me a while to get the entire list, but I have it now. Let me read it to you. c .net. That's what they originally called it, was C-sharp.net. C++.net. VB.net. j .net. JScript. That's a .net language. APL, COBOL. Component Pascal, Eiffel, Fortran, Haskell, Mercury, Oberon, Oz, Perl, Python, RPG, Scheme, Smalltalk, Standard ML, OCaml, and Ada. I can't imagine Ada actually running in the .NET environment, but okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know how many of those actually did go anywhere. I mean, COBOL.NET still alive and well and thriving. So there are other, you know, .NET languages out there. Uh, also notable, Fox Pro leaves the studio box at this point, goes off on its own. The following month, in March of 2002, the Rotor project is announced. Stephen Wally being the leader. Uh, and this is a shared source implementation of the CLR with a .NET runtime, base class libraries, a C-sharp compiler. They take all the Windows-specific stuff out but it doesn't have a traditional open source license, although it's 2002, open source licenses are pretty complex at this particular point. It has what they call an academic research license. So you can look at the code, you just can't compile it. Microsoft open sourced, quote unquote, .NET a few times. This is one of them. Uh, whether or not it actually made sense to anybody is another question entirely. 
And the following year, in April of 2003, the second version of .NET uh, 1.1 with the CLR 1.1, this is the bug fix version, sort of the stable one that everybody was really happy with, uh, persisted for quite a while. Now, if you think about it, in that PDC in 2000 and 2001, they weren't really doing professional dev stuff so much as they were talking about the future. And that trend will continue for a while in the PDCs. In PDC 2003, in Los Angeles, is the first time they mention the next version of Windows. So the code name for XP was Whistler. Whistler is the name of a mountain not far from where I live. The next mountain over from Whistler is Blackcomb. And the original code name for the next version of Windows was Blackcomb. Now, they had put out a lot of versions of Windows from 95 to 2001, pretty much nonstop, something every year. And they had dominated the market at this point. And so they kind of had an opportunity to go big on the next version of Windows. It's time to explore what is the next version of Windows going to be. And one of the big mantras driven by Bill Gates was object orientation. Let's make a fully object oriented operating system. And they came up with a specification of Blackcomb so complex and broad that even Bill went, whoa, dial that back. Pick something a little simpler. And between the mountain of Whistler and the mountain of Blackcomb, there is a bar called the Longhorn Bar. And so the version of Windows that they talked about in PDC in 2003 was called Windows Longhorn. And it had three pillars, Avalon, Indigo, and WinFS. Avalon was probably one of the most important pieces of this because what it was was an object-oriented way to draw on the screen. Now, Windows up until this point had been bit blitting on the screen, literally treating video as memory, and you're just drawing lines directly on the screen. But video cards had advanced since then. They had GPUs in them now. And so DirectX had been invented a number of years before to take advantage of the GPU, and games would run against DirectX, which is why when you ran a game in Windows, it would kind of go bonk, because it would switch over to the DirectX mode, and off it would go doing its thing. They wanted GPU utilization in Windows proper. It would make everything render faster, it would take advantage of the GPU. So that was a core aspect of Avalon, as well as a more descriptive, object-oriented way to draw on the screen. Indigo was the same core concept of object orientation for communications, both within process, inter-process, throughout the machine, inter-machine, and across the internet. A variety of transports, a variety of protocols, lots of choice and all that. Complex set of technologies. And WinFS, the new object-oriented file system. So that everything on your drives were treated as objects. That opening a document was just a method of that document that invoked an application. Now it's 2003, so they've been working on this for a couple of years, but not the entire Windows team. The Windows team is split in half right now because one half is working on the security fix, which we'd known as XP SP2, and the other half would be working on Longhorn. And SP2 finally ships in August of 2004, and Adam referred to this at the beginning of that because we were actually in Redmond in August 2004, the thing they called the Evangelism Airlift. And this is when Jim Alchin announced XPSB2. Longhorn was in trouble. It was late. It was 2004. And a lot of folks had forgotten about a deadline. Again, they'd had operating systems every year for quite a while. And suddenly they hadn't had one for a few years. Now, is this really a big deal? Well, yes. And here's why. If you're a large corporation that's buying product from Microsoft, you don't buy a thousand seats of office and 2,000 copies of Windows, you buy with a volume license agreement. And the volume license agreement basically says, how many people have you got working there? We'll give you this price per person. You have all of the products. And in that agreement is a guaranteed update. And the guaranteed update for operating systems is every five years. And the last time you shipped an operating system was November of 2001. So the deadline is November of 2006. It is August of 2004 when SP2 ships. Now why did Microsoft call this SP2? Because normally service packs are about patches and this was a breaking change to Windows. This broke things. 
re quite reasonably, they call it, called it, could have called it XP version 2, which also would have reset the clock on the volume license agreement to August of 2004. But they, this was a security set of patches, and they really wanted everybody to install it. It was important, right? This is going to help protect us against viruses. This is where the firewall came from. This is where UAC came from. A lot of protections built into SP2. It was an important version. And they felt that the service pack was the best way to get it installed. And so they didn't reset the clock. And Jim Alchin took over the Longhorn project and realized it was in trouble. It was August of 2004. He has less than two, just less, slightly over two years to deliver a new version of Windows and he basically needs to start over. And so, as Adam mentioned, he kicked out the three pillars to focus on the core of the operating system to try and get it together. So Windows is in a huge battle right now, although it's generally not well known publicly. I would also mention that this is when Channel 9 started for Microsoft. Microsoft is trying to rehabilitate their image. They're trying to show that there are people writing this software. I mean, we know this today, but it was a conscious initiative inside of Microsoft to do that. Guys like Robert Scoble running around the campus with a camera saying, hey, what are you working on? And putting those videos up so that we can see these things. And it's one of the problems I think that happened with that version of Windows is they were trying to be open about what they're doing, and so they promised more than they could deliver. But over on the .NET side, we were having a great time because 2005 edition, in November of 2005, the third version of .NET ships. It's the CLR 2.0, C Sharp 2.0, generics arrive, partial classes, anonymous types. The CLR 2 is dramatically better than the earlier version of CLR. And one of the reasons is they made it run inside of SQL Server 2005. Why would they do that? That's such a bad idea. The SQL team wanted it. The SQL team had customers in, two, in that era that were starting to do really big data operations and they needed a complex language to work against the data without having to copy the data out of the database the way you would if you queried and then ran the processing that way. They wanted to execute complex code within queries. And so they came to the .NET team and said, we want a version of .NET that runs inside the SQL Server context. And the side effect of making that work was they tightened the CLR up. They got it a little more abstracted from Windows, made it a little crisper, smarter, faster. Now, to this day, there's a version of .NET that runs inside a SQL Server. It's off by default. Take the hint. <laughs> Don't turn it on. There are very few cases where you actually want this capability. But I talk about it because it's important to the things that Microsoft does that makes their products better that they use it internally, they push it around, they dog food their own stuff, and those teams interact and make better product. And often when you see products inside of Microsoft that are struggling, that hasn't happened. And it's just an important part of their culture. A couple other things that happened in 2005. This is when 64-bit comes of age. I didn't talk about this much so far, but Intel kind of loses their minds in 2000 to 2005. They get cooked on the Pentium and a particular set of architectures that ultimately don't scale well. And their competitor, AMD, catches up, starts making processes comparable performance to the best Intel processors. And in the midst of all this, they're trying to figure out how to do 64-bit. Intel's solution was a processor called Itanium, a totally new architecture built from 64-bit from the ground up, and the two guys that bought it thought it was awesome. <laughs> We ended up calling it Itanic. Uh, Microsoft dealt with Itanium very well. There used to be an option to compile to Itanium. They eventually took it out, but in .NET, we could do that. AMD did something really clever. They came up with a set of extensions to the BIOS inside of the AMD processor. They called a, uh, X64, or AMD64, the 64-bit extensions. And a Microsoft guy by the name of Dave Cutler, who's a tech fellow to this day, we used to work for DEC, is responsible for NT, is like the god of the kernel inside of Microsoft, wrote a paper called Windows on Windows, where he showed based on this architecture, you could run 32-bit apps inside of a 64-bit context with a thunking layer that would be able to communicate between them. And that cemented AMD as the 64-bit solution, and within months, Intel had a similar set of instructions called IA64 to allow them to, or EMT, EM64T to allow them to do the same thing. And that set the 64-bit path. And that's also, so in Studio 20, 
2005, we got the compile to 64-bit option and the compile to 32-bit option, which defaults to the compile to any option, which was great as long as you only ever ran it on 32-bit. <laughs> if you actually took an app you compiled any and ran it on 64-bit, it would crash, I guarantee you. Except in demos. In demos, it would work. In real software, it wouldn't work. <laughs> Ask me how I know. All right. And I would say at this point, Studio and .NET has achieved its original goal. They have made a great managed memory development environment with a unified runtime, a robust language, an, in, an effective web solution. Although the web is now evolving and the world's about to get a lot more complicated. Microsoft launches a new conference in 2006 called Mix, where they're starting to really think more broadly about the web. And uh, this is where they first mention a new technology called WPFE that will eventually be called Silverlight. This is also when IE7 gets released in October of 2006, after five years of IE6. And people wonder, well, where did the IE team go? Why was there no new version of IE for so long? They were working on Avalon. It's a rendering engine. And the best rendering guys, they worked on the Avalon project. And uh, now they were back, and they finally put out a new browser. And later on that year, November of 2006, Vista came out. Now notice it was November of 2006. That was not an accident. That is five years to the month. The only version that came out in November of 2006 was the Enterprise Edition of Vista. It was the only version necessary to comply with the Volume License Agreement. All the other editions of Vista won't ship until March of 2007 when the problems are fixed. <laughs> they had to comply with the license. I, it's a very difficult decision they had to make. Do you try and renegotiate all of those contracts? Do you be late and breach the contracts? And you think about it, no enterprise guy's going to install the first version of Vista anyway. They all wait for Service Pack 1. So nobody's going to install this. And in fact, nobody did, except one group of people, <laughs> reviewers, because that's their job, right? They got their hands on Enterprise Edition and they found a very broken version of Windows and they told everybody. <laughs> and my mother told me, I don't want Vista on my computer. I don't think you're qualified for an opinion, but okay. But that's what went wrong. Now, a side effect of this is that they booted Avalon, Indigo, and WinFS out. They put it onto the .NET team. So as part of the release of Vista, there was suddenly a new version of the .NET framework, .NET 3, with CLR 2, they didn't rev that, and it suddenly grabbed onto Avalon, now known as Windows Presentation Foundation, Indigo, now known as Windows Communication Foundation, Windows Workflow, and Cardspace, which I always thought was a good idea, but apparently I was the only one. Uh, because they put it out separate from the operating system, we also got it for X, XP, XP2 as well. But in some ways, it was almost abandonware. They kind of pushed these things out to get the operating system out. The .NET team was not necessarily set up to deal with it. So now they're scrambling to figure out how are we going to incorporate these things? How are we going to tool for these things? This was not supposed to be our problem. So it's a tough moment for everybody. And in the middle of all of this mayhem, this thing shows up. <laughs> now, this was not a great phone when it first came out. And in a lot of ways, it was kind of the end of the phone because after this, they all looked the same. You know, before this, phones were cool. They had keyboards, they had antennas, some of them slid out, some of them closed up. But once the iPhone came out, every phone was a slab of black glass. It's kind of the end. They've been the same ever since. They get a little bigger, they get a little smaller, they got some extra blinky lights. They're all a slab of black glass. So I bring it up because you think about where the teams are at this particular moment. The iPhone, they're only paying so much attention to. Microsoft's been in the phone business for a long time up to here, so they're not all that worried about a really expensive phone. A uh, more interesting thing that happens is that Silverlight finally ships. And we did the interviews with Brad Abrams when he actually announced this product, and he came up with a secret. 
If you have a good code name, you end up with a crappy product name. Avalon becomes Windows Presentation Foundation. So his code name for Silverlight was Windows Presentation Foundation Extensions, <laughs> AKA Silverlight. And the original version, which actually ships in September of 2007, was just really a media tool. It used JavaScript as the primary language. You could do a little bit of XAML work for some of the UI pieces, but it was all about media playback. But right off the bat, it ran on the Mac, both Intel and the PowerPC versions running inside of Safari and Firefox. And Scott Guthrie, who drove this project, he did something else with Silverlight that I thought was very interesting. Because up until now, for the most part, the developer group put out a version of Studio with all the new tools about every year to 18 months. But he's shipping Silverlight out of band. So they put out this initial version and they'll put out four updates over the next 10 months. Not major version numbers, but incremental updates. So there's constant changes going on here. Uh, Scott also does another interesting thing. He starts hiring what we eventually called Scott Guthrie's Ninja Army. In fact, in October of 2007 alone, he hires Scott Hanselman, Rob Connery, Phil Hack. Other amazing people that are in that same time, uh, uh, Jim Huguenin, John Lamb, uh, Gl uh, Glenn Block, all heavily into open source. You know, we never really thought about Scott Guthrie's role on the open source side, but he sure assembled an open source army in 2007. And at the same time, they were working on an alternative to ASP.NET Web Forms, which eventually would be known as MVC. There was another movement going on in this time frame called Alt.NET. And Alt.NET had the best of intentions. There were some problems with some of their execution, but their goal was to help Microsoft developers, folks that use Microsoft tools, to understand that the open source community could help them, that there were products out there that were great, that they could use them. And because a lot of folks that developed on the Microsoft space back then, if it didn't come from Microsoft, they wouldn't use it. And these guys thought very differently like that. And they actually held a conference in October of 2007 in Austin and invited Scott Guthrie to keynote. And he said, yes. And he demoed MVC prototype at that conference as a keynote showing here's a testable, scalable web development tool that runs in ASP.NET and blew some minds and changed the dynamic. Meantime, fighting hard, we get by November of 2007, .NET 3.5. So this is the version that integrates WPF, WCF, all of those pieces together more cleanly, gives us a bit of tooling. Link arrives. That was a, a cool addition. And we start having this conversation about the idea of having a designer alongside a developer. We, we did some shows in this space as well. They're relatively hard thing to do because there wasn't a lot of guidance around using XAML and WPF. It was hard to do. Microsoft had not used it themselves at this point. Now I would argue that this was a mistake, that they should have taken WPF and started building a version of Office with it right away. Because for many, many years, that was the model for us as developers, a new version of Windows came out with a new version of Office that told you what software was supposed to look like. Within a year, there were new dev tools that let you build software that looked like Outlook. And you rinse, repeat. And that broke in this time frame for a couple of reasons. One is Office came out with the ribbon and then wouldn't let you have it. And uh, WPF really had no guidance. We were kind of just floundering, trying to figure out how to use it. And it scared a lot of people because if WPF is out, if this is a new way to build UIs, well, what happens to WinForms? Are WinForms dead? I'm always confused when folks say that. It's not like WinForms abruptly bursts into flames or anything. And it's not that there was no dev team on it. They continue to do some work on it. But they were sort of fussing around WPF. And Silverlight did very well. And Silverlight was a subset of WPF. It was XAML with C Sharp. So it was a good combination of tools. And so uh, folks were getting very excited about Silverlight. C Sharp, XAML, ran on the Mac, ran on the PC, had a great deployment model. It just worked through the browser, but you still had that nice controlled environment, so you weren't having to deal with all the vagaries of HTML. In fact, in this same time frame, the first public draft of HTML5 comes out. That's January of 2008. And in the October of 2008, they finally shipped the second version of Silverlight, which has full support for the .NET Framework 3.0. We now have the CLR running on the Intel version of the Mac only, but yes, that is CLR bits running on the Mac. 
Cross-platform development in 2008. Who would have thunk it? Mono gets to version 2. So it's equivalent of the version in 2005, although they have some later features already in place. And uh, Miguel Diacaza also announces Moonlight. So he's building a, ver a version of Silverlight for Linux. And uh, a guy named Ray Ozzy is now the chief architect. He actually came in the chief architect in 2006 when Bill stepped down and is now working full time on the foundation. He's going to cure malaria. And Ray wrote a paper just like Bill did, but his paper was about internet services. What he was basically predicting was the need of the cloud. And at the PDC in 2008, in fact, you can see the background. This is where he announces Windows Azure. And he talks about it in the context of what Microsoft needs, that Microsoft has a number of massive different web properties, MSN, MSDN, all of these different sites, and they all run on their own infrastructure completely isolated from each other. And it's kind of crazy. Why don't we have a common infrastructure that can run all of those things? We're going to have a cloud. We're going to call it Windows Azure. So that's that movement going on right there. At the same time, the Windows team is getting their act together and getting past Vista. And so after PDC 08, in October of 2009, we get Windows 7. And one, some would argue a really great version of Windows. We, we took a big step forward there, cleaned up a lot of mess, and started to get more organized around that. And shortly after that, in early 2010, the Windows Azure actually ships. And the first version of Azure there has SQL Azure, support for PHP, Java, and .NET. It's not very developer friendly. They, it's a completely different development model. You want to build web apps with, uh, with app services in the back end. You've got to approach in a particular way. It only runs in Azure. None of your existing stuff's going to port straight over, but you can use the same coding environment. And so we're all trying to figure out what Windows Azure is really going to do for us. And in the midst of all this, this piece of hardware shows up. March of 2010, the giant iPhone. And Jobs does what Jobs does better than anybody else, right? He hypes his device. He's going to create a new genre. There's been tablets around for years, but this thing is thinner. It is lighter. It is cleaner. I think it saved the tablet or saved the laptop. If you think about it in this same time frame in early 2010, laptops were racing to the bottom. They were trying to build a sub $500 laptop and they were made out of plastic and they were awful. And then this $800 tablet came out and it was gorgeous. And suddenly all those laptops were doomed. And so laptops actually had to bump up in price. The only thing that made sense was now about a $1,200 to $1,500 laptop, something nice, because you had this as the alternative. But within a month of him announcing the iPad, before he even ships it, he publishes a letter in the Wall Street Journal called Thoughts on Flash. What his thought on Flash was is Flash sucks. What he discovered was Flash killed the battery on the iPad because Flash is a badly behaved piece of software. And so he banished all plugins from Safari. That was his solution. Now, he had a number of explanations for why he was going to do that. It wasn't just about the battery life. Plugins are also a malware vector. And he wanted to control the software more tightly. But at that moment, the idea of mobile flash and mobile plugins, for the most part, died. It wasn't just the iPad. By the end of 2011, Adobe will stop making flash for mobile devices in general. Now, subsequent to that, other browsers, namely Chrome, will pick up and still run a version of flash on your devices and murder your battery. But this is an important moment. It may not have been for us. We didn't know, but it was an important moment for Microsoft because Silverlight's now jeopardized. Silverlight was the happy-go-lucky, we were having a great time up until this moment. It was C-sharp XAML. It ran everywhere we needed to run. It wasn't going to run on the iPad. And how important was that actually going to be? By the way, in the midst of all this, they did announce Windows Phone 7, which ran an even smaller subset of Silverlight. Uh, there's not a lot to talk about WinPhone. We kind of know the outcome of all this, but it's in the same context. And Studio 2010 comes out at Mix 10, well, actually after Mix 10, I actually worked on the launch event for this uh, in April of 2010. Important things about Studio 2010. This is the first product Microsoft actually implemented with WPF. 
They changed the IDE over to WPF and it made WPF dramatically better, just like every time Microsoft dog fused the technology, because those two teams then worked very tightly together to get things working more effectively. Silverlight 4 is out. It now supports Chrome. Chrome is the hot new browser at the time. It runs out of the browser entirely. They start running huge projects on it, like the, the, the 2010 Olympics used Silverlight as their primary streaming mechanism, which is kind of awesome. Uh, the first version of F Sharp arrives. So Don Syme, who's a researcher from Microsoft Research out of Cambridge, England, actually an OCaml guy, had been for years experimenting with using Studio to try out different language concepts. And he finally comes up with a version of uh, a vaguely OCaml-ish, Haskell-ish language that's very functional. And the production team, so Sagar, the dev team, like it so much, they actually want to incorporate it in the Studio. And so F Sharp starts shipping with Visual Studio 2010, which is cool, and it's still around today. There's one other thing that happens in 2010 that people forget, but Microsoft bundled jQuery into Studio 2010. The first time Microsoft had actually included a third-party open source library as a shipping part of their tools. Uh, the side effect of doing that is a thing called the jQuery Foundation, which basically provided controlled licensing and, prote and legal protection around jQuery. That entity would morph into the JavaScript Foundation. So, you know, it was still early days for open source at Microsoft, and yet they're doing some very important op uh, open source things at that moment. And later that year, in October, the last PDC, they did it at the Microsoft campus in Redmond. It was only about 1,000 people who could go. The space is not that big, but they streamed everything. So for the most part, if you were there, you were just an applause track. Everybody, it was mostly about the online thing. But something interesting happened in that event. Microsoft did a developer event and didn't talk about Silverlight at all. And people noticed. And a reporter by the name of Mary Jo Foley caught up with Bob Muglia, who was a president of Server and Tools, and asked him, why didn't you talk about Silverlight at PDC? And Muglia's quote is, our strategy has shifted. Now what he was talking about was the fact that the iPad and, and iOS wasn't going to run Silverlight. But it was a big blow. People flipped. It was shocking. And in the ensuing row, Muglia resigns from Microsoft. He's gone January of the next year. And the guy who fills his role is a guy named Satya Nadella. I've also, in pulling together the story, I realized it's right at this moment that Anders Halsberg leaves the C-sharp team and starts focusing on a tool that will eventually be called TypeScript. Because I think this is a very challenging moment for Microsoft looking at their dev tools, understanding that the client-side the client world is diversifying, and if they're going to be developing for them, they have to be able to handle that diversity. So they're trying to figure out what to do. And at the same time, they're pouring a ton of energy into JavaScript. These three browsers, the IE9 team, the Chrome team, and the Firefox team working on the Chakra engine, which was the IE9 engine, the V8 engine, which is the Chrome engine, and the JavaScript core Nitro engine, that was the Firefox engine. They basically start to duel to make faster and faster executions of JavaScript. Uh, they send each other cakes when they put out new versions that beat the previous milestones. There's all these measurements going on. And JavaScript grows up in a period of about a year and a half becomes a dramatically faster compiled language. For, for old folks that remember those early days of web development, JavaScript was this terrible scripting language bound to an awful DOM. And that was not the language these guys were working on. They grew it a long way. And one of the examples was Node. Node took the V8 engine and said, heck with the DOM, let's just use JavaScript as a dynamically typed, semi-functional language with some objects in it and just write some code. I mean, the other thing that's interesting about Node is it was a lashback against stuff like Apache and IIS. In the early days of the web, you had these two big web servers, and they're very, very similar. I mean, people get upset when you say that, but you know, the name Apache doesn't necessarily re re refer to the native Indian tribes of the United States. It's literally a patchy server. It had a lot of patches. <laughs> because it constantly needed updating because we were figuring out the web. But both those libraries, those tool sets, represented like a, a Swiss Army knife with all the blades pulled out. 
There was so many features built in to make the web easier for you. Node was the opposite. Node went the other way and said, all the blades are in. In fact, you have to forge each blade yourself. Each feature gets added intentionally, deliberately. Oh, and by the way, you're gonna write it in JavaScript. But now you can do JavaScript end to end. So interesting time. JavaScript has just gotten much stronger in this time period in 2011. And the la PDC is gone. The first build event happens in 2011. This is in September of 2011 in Anaheim. And this is where Microsoft announces Windows 8, Server 2012, Studio 2012. They also announce WinJS. JavaScript extensions for Windows so that you can write in JavaScript and communicate directly to the Windows libraries as well, which is interesting. It speaks to how seriously Microsoft was taking JavaScript inside of the organization at that point. By the way, this is also the moment where that consent decree finally ends after 10 years. And Microsoft is being very reflective. They think the iPad's a big deal, they have to figure out tablets in a different way, and Windows 8 is going to have a huge tablet focus. But they're unsure of what to do with the languages. Does C Sharp still make sense? Does JavaScript make more sense? And if you look at the company itself, the company is built on Windows. The billion dollar entities that all had revenues in excess of a billion dollars inside of Microsoft, obviously Windows and Windows Server, but also Office. Exchange, SharePoint, SQL Server, Visual Studio, Dynamics, System Center, which by the way, all only run on Windows. So the vast majority of this company's income is utterly dependent on Windows. So they're kind of protective of Windows, one way or the other. It's a big deal. And of course, there's a few businesses they have that aren't completely centric on Windows. There's Xbox, which is a billion dollar plus revenue business until you get the red ring of death. And Bing, okay, a billion dollars in revenue, just didn't actually make any money. And Skype, which they bought. It's a very dark time for C Sharp at that particular moment. But there's another guy, this guy. In 2011, Miguel Diacaza has for many years been building Mono. But he also got heavily involved in mobile development. In 2009, he actually shipped Mono Touch for iOS writing in C-sharp to, to run iOS devices. His own version of C-sharp, his own version of the framework. In 2011, he puts out an Android edition as well, Mono for Android. So he's showing mobile development in C-sharp at the same time that Microsoft's trying to figure out, does C-sharp still make sense or should we be doing everything in JavaScript? And at that same time, Novell goes down. They've been struggling for years, They've, been support, they've supported the Mono project all this time, and they sell to Attachmate. And Attachmate says, yeah, we're not going to work on the Mono project anymore. And so Miguel Diacaza grabs his friend, Nat Friedman, and they form a new company, Xamarin. And they, through hook or crook, pull the Mono project out of Attachmate to form Xamarin. And it takes off like a gunshot. It is the talk of the town. The tools may not be perfect, and they're tough to use, but the bottom line is C Sharp running on Android and iOS. And it's just that kernel of light that says, we could be running this language anywhere we wanted to. This guy's doing it with a group of largely volunteers. The next version of Visual Studio comes out in 2012. Uh, this is in the WID 8 timeframe. So this is when they released the RT edition. So RT, is that you're actually able to compile an RT, although most people remember 2012 for the fact that well, the menus were all in uppercase. That's what we really cared about. And we were very angry about that too. Another aspect that was going on inside of Microsoft was Microsoft OpenTech. So this was a spinoff outside of Microsoft run by a guy named uh, Jean Pauly, who was making sure that open, important open source libraries like Redis and Memcached worked well with Microsoft tooling, including .NET. So Microsoft was now consciously running a group to make sure that open source libraries, I mean, complete reversal from the alt.net days, where, the, where outside people say, you can make this work. No, now it's Microsoft making sure that it works. And later in 2012, WinPhone 8 will ship. Uh, in October 2012, we have the release of Windows 8, the release of WinJS 1.0 and the first announcements around TypeScript, and TypeScript being a tool to allow you to do 
for static type programming against JavaScript. Great, run by Anders Halsberg. And I think the parallels between that tool and J Sharp for J++ programmers are very similar. That he was preparing that if JavaScript was going to be the way going forward, this was a tool to help C Sharp people program in JavaScript. But that's not what happened. The corner got turned. In 2013, we started talking about Rosalind. Roslyn being a rewrite of C Sharp. It had actually been going on for a while. They were going to write C Sharp in C Sharp, which is weird. But you think about it, up to this, C Sharp had been written in C++, and it sort of hit the wall, and they wanted to re-engineer it, and so they were going to focus on C Sharp uh, as a whole. And Steve Ballmer announced that he was stepping down and started looking for a new CEO, and that new CEO became Satya Nadella. And so in February of 2014, Satya Nadella comes on board as the CEO of Microsoft. And a month later, Windows Azure becomes Microsoft Azure. Satya also insists that Bill Gates comes back to work at the company as well. And Bill to this day still does. He's not the face of Microsoft, but he still reviews all of the products. And you see his touch on a lot of things. Whenever you see a project coming out of Microsoft, like you might have seen in the latest build, Project Rome, where they're consolidating all the different tools that are trying to do identity into one set of projects. That to me sounds like Bill Gates looking at all the different teams and going, you guys are all building the same thing, you will build it once and we'll all use it. So Satya insisted on having Bill deeply involved in the company, although again, not the public face of the company. He's sort of in the background. But I, to me, this is a turning point. That even though a couple of years previously, Microsoft made all its money off of Windows, they decided to change. And you really saw this at the next build in 2014. This is when they announced the .NET Foundation. And Xamarin went into the foundation of a bunch of other libraries. So now they were actually managing the licensing of open source for .NET projects. The Rosalind project, the rewrite of C Sharp, ships and is open sourced and cross-platform. TypeScript ships. And Microsoft announces that Windows licensing is free on any device with a screen smaller than 9 inches the former crown jewel of the company, but if you got a little screen, we'll give it away. It was a very sudden change, whether we realized it or not. Between 2011 and 2014, the company fundamentally pivoted back to being a dev company that sold cloud services. That's what was actually important to them. And in 2015, we got the next version of Studio, which came along with Win 10 and the Edge browser, I'm not going to talk about the Edge browser. Uh, MS Open Tech actually gets rolled in back into Microsoft because there's no point. We are now doing open source development across the board. They ship Visual Studio Code built on the Electron engine, an open source project for working on Visual Studio projects. Interesting all by itself. And of course, HoloLens, which I, I mean, I firmly believe in the idea that the, that the visor is probably the thing that will actually displace the phone. I know we're all concerned about wearing stuff on your face, right? Google Glass made the glass and everybody got called a glass hole for wearing it. And I was trying to understand why. Like, why, why are we struggling to get past that? Because we've definitely gotten to a place where we're doing social, what was used to be socially unacceptable things with our phone, right? You walk around like this, you nearly walk into traffic. You're in the middle of a conversation, your phone vibrates, you simply pull it out and look at it. Like, we've come to accept these things. Why? My daughters, got smartphones fairly early on, they would bring them to the dining room table. That annoyed my wife, and she wanted to ban phones from the table, so I got her a smartphone. <laughs> then we all had smartphones at the table. We made it socially acceptable. I think when the visor is good enough, you'll just wear it. Because when somebody will say, wow, you look like an idiot wearing that, you know, I don't care, this is awesome, and you'll put it on them, and they'll go, oh my God, that's awesome, and then they'll want one too, because that's what happened with these phones. I think it'll happen with the visor. So I'm not gonna make fun of HoloLens. There's plays to come yet. And again, they're, the way they're building that allows us as developers to take advantage of it. But the big shift, of course, was the complete open sourcing of .NET and the .NET Core. So that was only last year, June of 2016, that they put out .NET Core 1. March this year, .NET Core 1.1. And we're expecting any time now, sometime this month, maybe next month, .NET Core 2, which just like uh, .NET Framework 2 was 
probably going to be the breakthrough version, along with Studio 2017, which I'm not wildly excited about. I still like 2015, but 2017 is getting better. And better licensing for all of those things. So what can we expect next? Well, you can see that Microsoft now is focused on DevTools because the product they really want to sell is cloud. And they can't charge you for a box of cloud. They only can charge you when you use the cloud. And so providing you with great tools to allow you to be productive and successful with your customers in the cloud, that's how they're going to make their living going forward. So they're incented to work on any platform, in any environment, in any language. And I think that's the shape of the tools that you're seeing today, is being able to provide all those things. And I think the future of .NET's never been brighter than it is right now. It's completely changed from the story of 2002, but it's also reflective of the world we're actually living in. And uh, I am optimistic. Thank you. <laughs>